Now, I know that there are some people who've had some experience in the room with thermography. We haven't got any level three expert thermographers in here yet, have we? That's good. That means I can pretend to be the expert in the room. Uh, so the plan for today, basically, um, as it's a workshop, I'm going to be doing as little, almost, uh, presentation as possible. And uh, we're going to end up basically getting you to play with the cameras, look at what a thermal imaging camera can do, um, and, uh, uh, and basically look at things around the room. But first, we're going to go into the presentation. So we've got, if you're going to find out where the future of thermal imaging comes from, in reality, you've got to look at the past. We're going to look at the present, and that's going to kind of mould into the future of where thermal imaging is going to go. Um, now, initially you might say, well, the cost is going to come down, and that's actually a, a, a very fair point. Um, but also we need to find more applications uh, for thermal imaging in all type of environments. So, first of all, so the past. Everything that has gone before is worse, is that correct? Not all the time. You'll have seen a few of our older cameras, those who've had uh, sort of access and, and uh, exposure to thermal imaging, will see some very interesting cameras there. Up in the top right hand corner, that corner, that's one of the first thermal imaging cameras that was ever produced. It actually ended up being put into a truck. Specifically, it was used uh, in the United States uh, and uh, to look at um, overhead power lines and it cost an awful lot of money. Um, it was a cooled technology, which means that the detector that they use has to be physically cooled, either via nitrous uh, or via some other means. And you'll see that uh, uh, in the past we've had cameras that really they look like industrial pieces of kit. Um, now, and it, in fact, if we look at this, this was a revolution, this particular um, uh, camera, because it was the first one that was portable and actually required people to carry nitrous bottles on a belt. <laughs> so that was their idea of portable back in sort of the 1970s, 1980s. Okay. Now, also I should say that whilst we are FLIR, we, we are a, a, a sort of thermal imaging company, we're the largest company, what I've tried to do today, apart from the branding that you see on the... On the um, uh, the, the presentation itself, I've tried to be agnostic, so I'm talking about general principles as opposed to rah rah, we're FLIR, we're the only person you should talk, think about. There are th other thermal imaging manufacturers in the, in, in the world and everything works in the same manner. This is the way that the market is going to be going. Um, so, however, with that being said, you can see back in 1964 we were s selling worldwide very small amounts of systems. By 2010, we'd reached 100,000 units per year. Now, that doesn't necessarily include the military uh, side of things, which they don't give figures out on. In 2014, we launched this little camera called the EX series, and in the first seven months, we'd sold 50,000 units worldwide. We now, we're now in 2016, we now produce more units in one week from our factories in Tallinn and Estonia um, than we did back in 2000 in a year, which gives you an idea of where thermography is going. Now, if every one of those thermal imaging cameras cost exactly the same <laughs> as it did back in 2000, I wouldn't be speaking to you today, I'd be on a yacht, and you'd probably be <laughs> surveying that yacht. However, you'll find that the cost has gone down uh, re relative to that. So, we fast forward to the present. Is this as far as we can go? Are we just going to be using thermal imaging for the traditional things like industry and that sort of thing? As of now, we've got our government system, so you will see thermal imaging cameras uh, on trucks, planes, rescue um, uh, 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 apparatus, uh, we've got border security. It all uses the same sort of um, information. Maritime for um, security and uh, detecting things like uh, man overboard, that sort of thing, which is used in more, uh, automotive, R&D, medical, and various other things. Maintenance. Maintenance of a building, 
maintenance of a, a, a factory. You'll find that a lot of the situations where you use a thermal imaging camera in a building or a factory are very much the same if you've got an engine or an electrical system. It basically, whatever you put these systems into, it really doesn't matter. A thermal imager can be used in that. You've also got things like gas detection, which I can go over later, law enforcement, firefighting, and then we've got outdoor activities. The thing we should remember is that a lot of this technology um, is all based off the same principles. Infrared energy is emitted by a target, and we'll go into that later. Um, and, uh, oh, and by the way, if anybody wants to interrupt, ask a question, feel free, because as I say, it's a workshop. Absolutely. Well, they're, what they're using is fixed systems. So the same type of system that would be used um, on, for instance, a, 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 a helicopter or a search helicopter uh, would be used on, a, 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 on larger ships. Um, same type of thing where you are basically, it's a CCTV camera, but it uses thermal. So you can see very far away, long distances with high sensitivity. You can. That comes with its own um, problems. Um, one, the, the, the technology that we really need to, to see quite far is using actually older technology, cool detector. And, and the issue that you do find is that if you've got a, a, a body in the water, it's a very small target. So in theory, you can see miles with these things. In reality, if you have someone's head effectively uh, coming out of, out of the water, that's where you get, get problems. But the good thing is that if you're um, uh, at night, that head shows up quite well up to a certain distance because it's hot in comparison to the, to, to the rest of everything else. So, and also we've got things like handheld cameras. So exactly like you would use a handheld camera here to do some industrial work, you would also use the same type of technology, possibly in a different form factor, to look over. Now, what they've said um, for seeing distances is if you want to, to adjust for the curvature of the Earth in terms of, say, anti-piracy, you've got to be three metres above the ocean, otherwise <coughs> your range is reduced. Um, but certainly that, the man overboard type of uh, uh, applications, that's one that's been used for quite a while. And it's basically, um, it's a fixed mount camera uh, that, 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 that can either be pan and tilt or has got uh, gimbal stabilisation, that sort of thing, just to account for, for, for sort of waves. And uh, th uh, companies like, for instance, Raymarine um, down in Portsmouth, who we own, um, they, that they were v are and have been very successful in that sort of... Uh, situation. Which brings me to another point is that um, we're very good at combining technologies. So for instance the, 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 the technologies that you see with thermal can be combined with say radar technology. So you can have a constant scanning of an area. When you see movement you can actually move your thermal camera and look at that, that area of interest. So that, that's where you can actually take the costs of thermal down is by using other technologies. On its own it's very good, with other technologies it's much better. So those are the, th the, the applications we've got currently. Morning. But we've also done things like um, put it into attachments that go onto smartphones. Low cost, sorry I didn't want to have that in, but it is low cost as you can see. Uh, you can get them cheaper, it will, it will snap into your Android and your, uh, your, your uh, iOS phones. Um, it's what we want, might call an entry level thermal imaging camera. It won't give you everything, but if you're for instance uh, in a situation where you want to have a quick look at a hotspot, get out uh, that, that apparatus and it will give you a visual indication of, of a hotspot that you're looking at. You won't get huge amounts of thermal detail, but dependent on your application, depends on um, uh, uh, what detail you can, uh, you can glean. They've even now put that directly into, a, into an Android phone. So rather than have a, um, uh, uh, an attachment itself, uh, CAT is the first company in the world to actually incorporate a FLIR thermal imaging camera in, in, into its uh, uh, technology. Again, bear in mind, 
and a lot of people sort of fail to understand, sometimes you can pay £30,000 for a thermal imaging camera and then they're saying, well, I can pay £500 for an entire phone. Is that the same thing? And the answer is no. <laughs> but dependent on your application, it may, it may be uh, sort of uh, yeah, suitable. Okay, we've done things uh, like put uh, low-end thermal cameras into products like test and measurement. So again, we're incorporating other technologies and using thermal uh, to really act as an addition rather than just say, well, this is thermal, this is all it can do. You'll find with many technologies, if you incorporate it with other technologies, there's no end to, 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 to uh, the results you can get. We've put it into drones. So if you're um, trying to do aerial surveys, you can do that. I would say, however, th that we've only just started to go into this sort of um, field. If you're looking for complex thermal uh, surveys of um, vessels, may I suggest this probably won't be the best one. It's, it's, a, it's an entry level. Um, you can do things like see hot spots, that sort of thing. However, if you're looking to do a, a thermal survey with some detail, we'd probably have to get you, some, get, get you into something some, somewhat bigger, somewhat more expensive. But we're just at the first sort of um, uh, uh, reaches of this, and it's good to know that this is, this is w uh, what we, we're doing at the moment. Again, we've currently got our, our cameras in, um, in search and rescue and military. Uh, we have our, our cameras in luxury motor vehicles. It's used to augment um, vision. One thing I should say is that just because Top Gear says you should be able to turn the lights off and use only thermal, that's a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> There are certain th situations when thermal is not everything. And also we've got this application which is very interesting. We can actually, with um, uh, highly, I'll say it, highly expensive cameras, look for things, things like gases, certain gases we can see. We've used that on offshore oil rigs very successfully. Um, and uh, yeah, things like power um, applications where you've got the gas SF6, which is highly, um, uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, active greenhouse gas, and there are legi there's legislation to try and reduce that. If you can see those sort of leaks, then that's something that may be uh, of, uh, of, of interest. So that's what is happening presently. So where's the future? Well, the future is going to be a complicated one because some of the cameras that you're going to be able to sort of have a play with later on in, the, uh, in this, um, they're not going to disappear. We're not going to um, completely get rid of them. But what we are going to do is start adding to their usefulness. So, this is where it does get a little bit commercial. I will go past it as fast as I can. We are the number one thermal imaging manufacturer within the, within the world at the moment. So what we're going to do is leverage that to basically make our technology cheaper. Now, if you make your technology cheaper, you're going to need to find more applications for it. So we've currently got, as, as we've uh, alluded to, those very high-end uh, thermal imaging cameras that can see for miles um, and are used in very uh, varied applications. We've got our smaller cameras. We can now get a, a, a camera really for about £500, a standalone unit. And what we're going to be doing is basically pulling in all sorts of um, uh, um, uh, applications where we can push thermal imaging. And a lot of this is going to be down to uh, you, the end user. You're going to come to us and say, OK, how can I use this? Tell, tell me what else I can do. Um, so we're always open for people say, ringing up saying, look, can I use it for this? I don't know when is the right time to make this question. Please, carry on. Right away before I forget it. Yeah. Um, we got, uh, you know, our thermal surveyors got the in-house camera. I'm afraid it's not there. It's don't worry. It's a thermal camera. camera. You know, your computer, it's probably your computer. Uh, when my surveyor, but uh, the girl that is using it, she's certified, she went through the course and so forth. Um, it's more 
the course she took to get certified was clearly focused on buildings. Yes. Okay. Although the instructor um, gave the limits of how to use it, and yeah. so, and so on. So she got certified. Now, for us as surveyors and, and, and those, I don't know how many in the room are using this technology, but. Uh, it, for us, it was useful to use it on, uh, on board yachts for the uh, main switch course, you know. So yes, absolutely. Um, do you see or do you have courses uh, that actually focus on uh, the use of these cameras absolutely. on yachts? Definitely. Specifically? Yeah, uh, not on yachts specifically, absolutely, because they... This is different. I mean, trust me, I mean... I, oh, absolutely. I mean, before coming here, we probably had a look at what we do. Yeah. So you have big engine rooms, yeah. uh, you have the issue of having ventilation moving around, absolutely. you have a lot of the, uh, it is different than being in a... In a, in a oh absolutely, I mean in, in an engine room um, we have, we, we have the first, my, one of my colleagues was saying when he did a, a training course, is thermal crossover, this, this principle of where you, when you use thermal in surveillance applications, about half an hour before sunset, um, the temperature starts to change and effectively you get huge amounts of noise and the thermal starts to stop. Usually, in most situations, you don't come across that when you're looking at electrical and mechanical applications, absolutely. However, the one time that he saw effectively everything, if you would like, whited out, or in this case, redded out because of the, ther the temperature he was using, absolutely, it was in an engine room where the temperature had got to such a point where you couldn't see anything. And you're absolutely right, it's something that we need to sort of look at. But what we have got um, are courses <coughs> that are uh, tailored towards electrical mechanical. Mm -hmm. Now, is it, you know, we, you're talking about UK, of course. Yes. Uh, uh, worldwide well, well, as well. Worldwide well, yeah. as well. We've got, a, 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 well, we've got a division of FLIR called the ITC, or Infrared Training Centres. Um, and if our demand is big enough, we're always looking to put new courses on. So for instance, when you saw um, the uh, application for finding gas earlier, mm -hmm. when, we, when we made the camera, it didn't have a training course yeah. <laughs> associated yeah. to it. And this is something, by all means, talk to us about these things, say, okay, this is, and my cards are there, I'll forward it onto the relevant people. Um, if you've got an application where you say, okay, right, I need electrical, mechanical, but I also, I might be looking at holes. So I might need something like active thermography, where you're, where, where you're actually uh, uh, putting heat into a surface and watching it cool down to be able to see the faults. Under those circumstances, you're absolutely right. It's not about the camera you use. You could spend £100,000 on a camera. If you don't know how to make that situation correct, uh, or, or, or push the situation in your favour, you're just going to be going, I can't see a thing. Well, yes, because you've got the sun. It's been beating down on it all day. It, it loses it. So absolutely, if anybody has got those applications, please take a card and I'll forward that because we've already, as I say, got the electrical, the mechanical, and the materials applications. If we get enough people together, we will happily amalgamate that into, uh, uh, into t t to whatever type of course you, you look for. We may have to do sort of an international type of course where people come into a central point, but absolutely, if there's that there's big enough demand, by all means, we will do that. And another thing, and this, I, you know, I just repeat what I've been told by my colleague, is the report writing, say so the use of information and, and uh, handling thing. It sounds like the two, the, the, between Flair and Fluke, there are some differences in the software and stuff. Oh, like that. absolutely. Which I'm not going to say who's best. No, no, because I mean, it's the no point is not it's user, absolutely. But it's got to be user friendly. I mean, yes. us as surveyors, we need to boom, give out the yeah, report yeah. quite quickly. So absolutely. that's something to keep in mind. It, it all depends on what you're trying to get. And again, we can go into this. It's actually a really good point. You're always, when you're doing uh, surveying reports, thermal, any sort of report, how much information you need to put in and get out, very often, and again, this is again, it's a skill, just taking a thermal camera and pointing it at something is good, but sometimes you need to explain that. You're absolutely right, in very many cases, um, report writing, 
you've got two types of report writing. You've got a basic report writing where you put some basic information out and you can bang it out uh, automatically. I've designed um, templates where you can actually do that, say, in electrical terms. So you'll look at an electrical cabinet and if you see over 55 degrees, for instance, it will give you a, a fault criteria. And that you can do very fast. However, if you're looking at more complex reporting, you may need to sort of go on the, on the, on the start. You've, at the beginning, there's a lot more work, but once you've got that type of reporting and, um, and uh, a way of doing things, then you can, uh, then you do the, the, uh, the survey, and then you've got everything available. But yeah, you're absolutely right. The reporting side is difficult. For, for, really for us, I think the, the first level is already good enough because we're looking at a lot of things. Absolutely. Actually, the looking at a switchboard is one of the hundreds of things we're looking at. Of course. Oh, then if the client wants to go back and focus on that issue, we can always yes. go back and, and say, but it would be really, you know, these things for, uh, at least for me, I speak for myself. Uh, it's not enough to buy a camera. I want people. Uh, oh no! That it was just like my colleagues sort of trained all of us a little bit to, yeah. to use it just in the basic level. Uh, but uh, courses, you know, just focused on maybe our. Definitely. I mean, I've I've now got to the stage where I suppose it's because I've been doing it so long. But I will actually, when someone says, rings me up and says, "What camera's correct?" You go, actually, what I'll recommend is that you don't buy a camera yet. You go on to say a one day introductory training course or something like that, and then you'll get a better idea of exactly what, what you're doing. It's something that is problematic, I think, in our entire industry, is that you will get the salespeople walk in and go, yeah, yeah, this will be the easy sale. Yeah, you want, you want this camera. This will do everything you do. And then, then you get the backward wave, wave, waving rep scenario, as they used to say. The issue is that you don't grow business that way. What, what we should be doing is coming into, uh, especially if you've got several surveyors or several engineers, is coming in and going, I don't want to sell you one camera, I want to sell you training, and I want to sell you eight cameras. Even if the, the eight cameras have to be sort of a, a lower end camera, if I can teach you how to use that technology better, you won't worry that you spent twice as much because you're getting eight times more value than you would have if you'd have just bought one camera and one level one that was, that was focused on building. So absolutely. Um, we have got lots of online free courses. Um, if you, my cards are somewhere, I'll leave them at the end. Oh, if I'm you not, I, I subscribe to your, uh, I get them. The oh, the ITC. It's, it's time, it's like, I want to sound, it's like I have my colleagues dealing with that. I'm trying to of course. do other things as well. No, absolutely. And, if you're uh, managing them, uh, they feed me when they can. And this 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 girl in the company that, that took the course and everything, she's the one teaching me of course. one on one and uh, rather than go online. Say, but uh, if, it, if it were something focused on, on yachts, it would be interesting. Definitely. I don't know how. <laughs> and thanks for the answer. A absolutely. We're, it was we're, exhausting. We're, we're all, no, we're always looking. Uh, to actually expand our courses, so uh, and a lot of the things that you'll be used to, we'll, we'll already have have sections so we can bolt it together and do do specific courses. Definitely. Any other questions before I move on? Excellent. So we are going to be reducing the price of thermal imaging, but in a very specific way. This is the lepton core. It basically will fit into the, the sub, uh, to, to the products that you've already seen. It's the same um, footprint as a mobile phone camera. Now, bear in mind that you're not going to get great um, thermography resolution from it, but you can use it in very many ways. As we see, we've already put it into the, into the camera, we've put it into test and measurement. The more this technology, basically, but I'll, I'll go into what it is later, the more we can incorporate this technology um, into monitoring, the cheaper it will be and the cheaper all of our cameras will be. But we'll be okay because we've, we've, we've got more volume. So as we see, we've put this into cars. At the moment, it's only luxury cars. Imagine if we reduce the, car, the, the price of our thermal by 90%. Suddenly, you're going to put it into your standard Passat. So this is the type of technology we've used. We've designed it 
really as a, 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 as a very small form function. Now, this is an interesting one. We've actually changed, and for those experienced in thermal, you'll have seen why our thermal imaging cameras are so expensive. This is a lens made of germanium. It's a third the price of gold currently. And if you, when you come and pick it up, please don't drop it, <laughs> it, it, it will cost an awful lot of money. What we've done is actually taken lenses and we've made it wafer. So that manages to, to bring the cost down quite significantly. The optics are somewhat compromised, but we can, we, we, we've pushed it into a wafer format. Mass producible. So at the moment when you buy a camera from Fluke or FLIR, it's not quite a bespoke product, but it's almost a bespoke product. Because of the numbers you've seen we're selling, it's not millions, it's hundreds of thousands, it's 500,000 a year. If you were to look at that as, say, a Samsung TV, they sell millions and millions. So the, 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 um, the, the overall aim of this industry and us as a company is to find more applications where we can use this type of technology. And again, we've got the thermal sensor and our own um, application-specific integrated circuit. So again, this, has gone into, this is going to be going into things like phones in the future, surveillance for lower cost items. If you were to say take a fixed camera, a uh, visual camera, and then compare a similar sort of product in thermal, the cost is, is, is staggering. Again, it's, it's, it's volume that's driving this. We've even done, uh, got higher um, resolution cameras. Again, because of the wavelength that we're working in, you'll see that's a lot bigger than the, than the one we've used. We've got a limitation in terms of how good our resolution can be uh, dependent on the size of the technology itself. But it's the smallest uh, detector we've ever done. So you could imagine that going into all sorts of places like smart home, smart factory, smart yacht. Was anybody at the, uh, the last, the last uh, uh, presentation? There are issues with smart <laughs> um, because of the, the sort of potential for, uh, for hacking. But we're, we'll look at several applications here. So we've got IR camera. So what that actually means is an in, uh, infrared LEDs with a normal visual camera. What if we could bring the price down to the point where we could use full thermal? Body sensors. At the moment, if you're using a PIR, we've all gone down those energy-saving hotel rooms where you know that the light is going to go on, but you're 10 foot down the darkness going, are you going to come on because I'm, <laughs> I'm starting to lose my direction? <laughs> Something like a thermal imaging application would be able to, uh, because you've got more effectively measurement points and more resolution, you'd be able to use something like that. Uh, temperature measurement, all sorts of things where you could constantly do this. And the first thing that we've, that we've moved into is the FLIR AX8. Sorry, it is a bit um, producty, but it's what we do. This is the first camera we've got, which is a standalone smart camera, designed with a lower resolution, um, but designed to really be placed permanently within, say, an electrical board or an area of critical um, uh, importance where you can actually um, uh, monitor 24-7. This does not replace <laughs> doing a good th th survey because this is, they say it's smart, but it's not as smart of me, as me, if you know what I mean. You can't replace everything with automation. But what you can do is start putting them in critical areas engine rooms, electrical cabinets, control areas, where if there was a fire, you would be able, and I guarantee this, to detect this earlier because of the, 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 the properties of thermal than you would using traditional um, uh, um, applications. A lot of your fire prevention is basically, there's a fire, now we need to do something about it. This is the type of camera where you see a sharp rise in temperature on an area, and that will allow you to remotely be able to say, right, we, somebody needs to do something about it. So this is where the thermal can, can, can become uh, useful without necessarily having a user at the end of it. 
supply? Power supply, just a 12 volt Ethernet. No, you can do it as a trigger alarm. You, you set the parameters. Say you want to say, I've seen, for instance, a, um, a 12 degree or a 20 degree rise in temperature over X number of days. Or oh, sorry, even, even minutes or hours, dependent on how sensitive you want, want to make it. And then you can actually set this camera to, do, uh, uh, to send an email or... Um, uh, send a trigger to a PLC, which would, can then do very, uh, many things. That's the smart bit, but it's not that smart, if you know what I mean. But certainly you can use this. This has been used, um, not your application, but certainly in, the, in data centers, where if you have a critical fire, you are literally using, losing hundreds of millions of pounds worth of, of kit. And what can we say, if you've got a vessel that is out on the ocean, if you have a fire, it's exactly the same thing, you, but also you lose life as well. So it's this type of technology where we see the future coming in. It doesn't replace uh, surveying in any way, uh, thermal surveys, but what it does do is it's an addition to it, and it's where the future is going. It's that smart technology. Is it emission protected? Uh, we are working on that. The, the moment it's just IP67 rated, but you mean uh, explosion proof EX. We, we are going through the process of, of having an EX rated um, model. But yeah, I know exactly what you mean. If you're going to put it in a critical system, say where you, where you have uh, CAC, uh, oh, zone one, zone two, at the moment the answer is no. Um, but it's something, again, which, which we will be doing in the future and we're, lo we're looking at doing, absolutely. We're going through the um, uh, the ATEX approval as we speak. When we'll do it? I don't know, because it can take a while to, take, to get through ATEX. But again, that's an application where, um, where, where we're very keen to sort of move <coughs> forward. Any other questions? Okay. So, what's the time? Yeah, we're doing well. I'm going to go through this quite quickly because I'm going to give you a good 10 minutes just playing with cameras. We're going to go into, this is valid for all thermal imaging cameras, but specifically for survey type cameras. How do you know that your results are valid? Sometimes you need actual measurements. Sometimes you're looking for hot spots. Sometimes you're actually looking for valid temperatures. So, how does the camera measure? Not as easily as we'd like it to. All thermal cameras, be they surveillance, or thermography cameras, or the things you put in your mobile phone. If we have a target here, the camera lens has infrared radiation coming upon it. A portion of that infrared radiation is emitted from the target, a portion is reflected, and then you have transmission, where the signal is effectively attenuated by the atmosphere. That reflected radiation can come from anywhere. It can come from you, it can come from the sky, albeit the sun, radiators, overhead heaters, that sort of thing. Dependent on how much radiation is emitted and how much is reflected, this can really affect your results. And for your level one guys who use it all the time, I'm really sorry because I'm going over things you already know. So, let's put this into maths. It's an efficiency equation. Your emitted radiation plus your reflected radiation plus your transmitted radiation is equal to 1. Under 3 metres, in reality under about 8 metres in most situations. You don't have to worry about that. So all you're worrying about is your proportion of emitted versus radiated. So if E is equal, and this is where the workshop cup starts coming in, if your emission is high, that's good because the majority of the energy that a camera perceives is emitted. If your emission is low, then you can't trust what you're looking at. And it's really good because we've got lots of, when you pick up the cameras, we've got lots of brass stuff over here. Have a look at the brass and just wave. And you'll see how badly this, this can affect things. So, copper. The emissi emissivity is 0 0.02. That means 2% of the energy that you see 
on the camera is emitted. 98% is reflected from the environment. Would you want to look at an electrical cable with a thermal imaging camera? Yes, but may I suggest you look at the insulation as opposed to the raw copper because you're, the, the, any results you get are going to be completely erroneous. As we see, electrical tape, 0.95, so 95% of the energy that you, that you see. Sorry, carry on. Does it depend on thickness or is it just the... No, surface. Because you can change the surface. Say, for instance, you've got a, a piece of copper and it's got electrical current running through it. You turn off the electrical current, and if you were, not this may be a good idea, were to spray um, black, matte black, sorry, matte paint, excuse me, matte paint onto the surface, you've changed the surface, and that makes it high emissivity. So it doesn't matter about the thickness. Um, because remember, thermal imaging is only measuring the surface temperature. The thickness comes in when, you when you're talking about insulation properties, but the actual surface of it, emissivity, is very specifically for the surface temperature. So, for instance, if you're looking at a person, they've got anywhere between 0.95 and 0.98 emissivity. So pretty much all of the energy that the camera perceives is energy that is, is being emitted. We can actually compensate to a certain degree above 50% emissivity by a diffuse infrared reflector. Now, in science circles, they recommend you make this of gold. And all it is, is say you know that the material you're looking at is electrical cable, and you're looking for accurate results, I might add. Well, we know that 95% of my reading is emitted. What about the other 5%? You can actually use something like this, preferably not when the electricity is on. <laughs> do it before you open the electrical cabinet. And what you can do is actually put this into the camera, measure the average temperature that the camera thinks it sees there, and then put that into the camera, and you can compensate for the extra 5% to give your um, readings the absolute best. Again, I would recommend that when you start picking up the cameras, I'm going, I'm, acutely aware that I'm, yeah, we've still got some time. Uh, have a look at the, the, uh, this because you will see lots of reflections and this is where you've got to be very careful with any type of thermal survey is what are you looking at? What's the, what's the surface of the material? And again, that's where training comes in. Resolution. This is one thing I sh should mention very quickly. Why do we pay £500 for one camera and £20,000 for a cup, another camera? Simply measurement points. The more measurement points that we can get onto a, uh, onto a target, the more reliable and the better image we get. And the smaller those, uh, those uh, um, uh, pixels are. If you ever look at a thermal imaging camera, it will um, have a pixel pitch or a, it says instantaneous field of view and then it's done in milliradians. If that confuses you, all that is is what your pix individual pixel size is at one metre. So if it's 0.62 milliradians, that means that at one metre, one pixel on your camera is 0.62 of a millimetre. That's all it is. So if you want to find out how, how, uh, how big your one pixel will be at, uh, uh, at 20 metres, 30 metres, 200 metres, you just times it out from there. Okay, now, we've gone through a bit of th um, theory. What, and this is, ask the audience, what does this image tell us? There is no wrong answer. Yep. Anything else? Is the heater on? Yeah, anything else? Good question. Somebody probably seen this image before. <laughs> okay. Now, the reason I ask this is because it's a workshop, I've got to try and get you to think about thermal. And an image is not an image. An image is a gateway into something. It's that 
that interprets the image. It's not that or your software. <clears throat> so this is what FLIR says. It's probably winter season. The ground temperature is below zero. Yeah. From the image, we know it's a 4 by 4 so we've recognised what we're looking at. The lights are on. Do you agree with that? Have a look at the scales, the side. Xenon headlights get quite, he quite hot. But I would agree they certainly were at some point. The car has been driven lately because the tyres are warmer than the ground. Yeah, I'll go with that. Front tyres are warmer than the rear ones. Possibly front wheel drive. The defroster is on. That'll give you. Can you see if anybody's in there? No. Thermal imaging does not see through glass. Can't see through it. You may get a reflection when you look at glass, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's reflective. I won't go into the principles of that. That's for a, for a training day. If you want to speak to me or email me afterwards, I'm more than happy to send you the link on the, <laughs> on the, on the uh, situation. Motor is running or has very recently been turned off. And, as we said, impossible to see if someone has seen into it. Excellent. So, that's the end of the slide. So, have we got any questions? How can we can't see through glass? Sorry, what was that? How can we can't see through glass at all? Because in, the infrared radiation that we look at in the frequency that we look at doesn't pass through glass. That doesn't mean so that... So, that's made of uh, non-glass material. Hence why it's a germanium. Absolutely. So you can't convert a normal camera into a long wave thermal imaging camera. Don't get me wrong, near IR does pass through. Absolutely. But in the frequency that we look at, both in cooled and non cooled cameras, it, in cooled cameras you can do certain things. <laughs> but in non cooled cameras, the type that, 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 are, um, uh, that, that we see on the table here, the, that the infrared radiation in that frequency will not pass through glass, or not to the point where we can see it. Any other questions? Yeah, which which cameras? I want to know if I waste my money. <laughs> no. meaning, meaning that you know you go from thirty thousand to five hundred. Yeah. So uh, I sort of touched on what we look at on yep. a survey. Um, uh, you know. It's really, I think, if, if the operator is good, in theory, he could use a very cheap camera oh, yeah. and obtain, uh, yeah, so that makes me feel like no, wasting my money. Not <laughs> necessarily. <laughs> the thing is, don't you remember I was talking about IFO? No, the good thing is, on the report, the, the picture we take, of, uh, yeah. it looks really nice. So that's probably the difference also, between how much you spend, you know, if you spend we spent a couple of years ago we spent eight thousand euros on that yeah thing. so but also think about what you're looking at if you're looking for instance specifically at electrical cables mm -hmm. if you get say oh, there's an e4 e5 let's have a look at the e5 it's switched off automatically that has a much smaller ifov or, or pixel pitch than say my t1000 does so what you'll find is if you're looking at an individual cable, say my finger is a cable, mm -hmm. if your pixel, or in many cases a measurement pixel, which is different, goes over here, mm -hmm. it won't measure that, it will measure that. Mm -hmm. Now, if you know what you're doing, and this is where training comes in, this usually goes somewhere. So if you're looking for heat, you, 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 can, you can find areas that are, that, that are bigger. Um, but absolutely, there are certain situations where more temperature measurements mean better results and smaller targets. So remember, in electrical, you sometimes have six mil cable. If you spend, if you spend 8,000 euros, you can guarantee that the camera that you get will have, um, will have, uh, have found the hottest point. And that's very, very, um, it's a shame I haven't got it on, on uh, uh, today. Uh, you can take, because I just couldn't carry it. You can take a, a cheap camera and say, what's the hottest point you can see on this, uh, on this circuit board? And you can take an expensive camera, and sometimes it's ridiculous, the, the, the level of temperature. 
Um, there's one which I can't share because it wasn't mine, but he went into, um, uh, he looked at an electrical cabinet and he looked at it, believe it or not, with an E40, which is still a quite a good camera, said, what's the biggest temperature I can see here? And it said 92 degrees. He took a more expensive camera, it was 160. Just because the source of temperature was very, very small, and that difference was literally, it was a same, it, it went from this is really dangerous to this is about to explode, we need to leave. And that's where your, your resolution, that's why you pay more on your resolution, you've got more and smaller temperature points. Yes? Can I ask a question regarding of course. how caught were the the images, if you're presenting something to the court, what experience have you had in that area? That is a very, very good question. And it depends on the, on the uh, experience of the person who took it. Okay. And that is a real, it, it could turn around and say, throw all these cameras <coughs> out. The person who is experienced and trained and knows their stuff, will be able to explain what they think is going on. So if he's in cross-examination, he would have to put his hand up and say, I've got this training, that training, the other training, therefore what I'm telling you is that. Yes, absolutely correct. And the thing is, I've said this, I had this conversation with building surveyors and electricians and all sorts of things. It's a case of, look, you know when you walk in to a situation, you've got 20, 30, sometimes 40, 50 years of experience you know basically what's probably going to go on. And then you put a clamp meter on it and use a thermal imaging camera and you prove what you pretty much already suspected anyway. <coughs> the difference is that you can then report that to the client in a manner that they can understand. And it's very frustrating to me because, you know, there, there are people who have spent their lives trying to do this sort of thing and then people will go, oh, well, I've seen this on a thermal imaging camera. And you're like, you're not going to listen to the guy who's got 30 years of experience and knows what he's talking about. No, I'll listen to this dumb piece of kit. It's, it's the person who's using the kit. But no, you're absolutely right. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be an expert thermographer. You can be an expert engineer as long as you, as long as you went, I saw this hotspot. You still want to do the course. I mean, you oh, absolutely. He's certified in that way because that's exactly what he was saying. I mean, somebody's going to tell me how to look. I go, you know, the operator was a certified operator. Right? Yeah. It might not be somebody that does that every single day, but at least, yeah. you know, he went through a course, you know what he's using. And Absolutely. And also, this is where I was saying with, um, uh, with, with using other technologies, you see an area of concern and you don't, don't just say, yeah, well, that's an overloaded circuit and leave it. You then, you investigate further. You get another engineer to see, uh, to tighten things up. And he says, oh, yes, it was tightened. And then you have that traceability of, of, where, uh, of <coughs> where this just shows you early what might be happening. Because sometimes you'll see, some, say, an electrical circuit, someone will go, that circuit's four degrees above everything else. Yes, it's on. <laughs> Nothing else is on, and this is on. <laughs> and you've got to be able to recognise that that is the situation. I mean, the worst one, and I'll, this is a very funny survey, was at a prison in London, and they did a thermal survey of a uh, fire suppression system, the electrical part of a fire suppression system. <laughs> One, it was open uh, metal, and two, how can you do a thermal survey if the circuit isn't on? There was no fire. And they literally said, well, because there's no temperature difference between this and ambient, this is safe. It's a fire suppression system. The only way you can test it is if it's on. You find some way of putting current through it. Otherwise, your thermal image is Tosh. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. It means nothing. So again, this is where, and I think this is this has turned into a, a sort of a, a, a push towards training. We don't necessarily need the cameras, but what we do need is is, is the, the operators to be trained. Definitely. John, is this a good point to wrap up? I think it is. Sorry, I got. You're welcome to try and have a look at the cameras. I do apologise. We uh, went into a discussion. Can I just thank John for uh, being here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, great. John. I appreciate it.